what do you seek to accomplish with what you do? Why do you do it? And then what are you, hope, what are you hoping to accomplish? We just, uh, most, a lot of us just came out of Sunday school and in the adult classes we talked about King David and the lesson was kind of uh, in the same mind frame of trying to kind of question, not doubt, but questioning his motives of why David sought to, to build a temple for God and build a house for God. And, and, uh, and yet in that lesson we learned that, uh, that God told David, I will establish a name for you. So it wasn't David that didn't have to send out, set out to, to establish his name. Um, we're still talking about King David, so his name definitely was established. But it was God's idea to establish his name, but more so his throne, which is fulfilled through Christ. And so uh, that's kind of what we were thinking in, in Sunday school. But now we come to a different story, a different uh, Bible passage, uh, not too far removed from that Sunday school lesson as well. But I'll tell you right up front, uh, if, you, if you know my sermon sometimes, uh, I'll give you the first point and that kind of stuff. I'm going to spend most of my time in the background, and then I'm just going to punch you at the end with the, with the main idea, and then we'll get out of here, all right? And we'll have that extra time, so I can either talk slow or we can get out of here early. We'll see, we'll see what happens. But most of my, uh, the, the, the idea for today comes with the background of where the setting is for this, this story that takes place. There was an event recorded, and I'm teasing you by not telling you where to go in your Bible, all right? Uh, there was an event that was recorded in Genesis, so I'll give you that much, uh, that brings to light people's motives and their desires. So when we kind of look at uh, different events and different people in, in, in the Bible, we can begin to identify them, either that, that we, we're not like that or we are like that, but it kind of... It kind of tells us our motive as in, and helps us to question our own motive of what we're trying to do in life. Last night I was at, at, at an event, not a biblical event, well, kind of, but I was at a wedding uh, in Stillwell, Oklahoma. Those of y'all that know uh, Josh McCopeland, McCopeland, say that wrong every time, McCopeland, uh, and Cameron. Uh, uh, Carmen, there we go, get the names right, yeah, whatever their names, I got it right last night, that's what's important. They are now Mr. and Mrs. McCulpin, and uh, so they got married down in Stillwell last night, it was a lovely wedding, and the weather helped, it was an outdoor one, so we were so glad that the weather didn't do what the weatherman said it was going to do, uh, but it was a beautiful outdoor wedding, and, and, uh, and as we gathered there, and, and as I typically do in my uh, wedding ceremonies, uh, Bride walks down the aisle. What a sweet moment! I could, I could just almost hear Josh just kind of tearing up behind me and, and sniffling a little bit. And I didn't turn around to look, but I think he was uh, loving the moment as his lovely bride walked down the aisle. And then we ask who gives her to be a give, who gives the bride to be given to the to the groom, and and the, her dad said it, her mother and I, and so he sat down. And then as they come together for the short but sweet ceremony of a, of a wedding, I always ask a question before we even start. So it's right at the beginning uh, of the message. I ask them a question about their intent, a question about their motive. Why are they here? And I just clarify, are you here indeed, each one of you, to take the other one as your spouse and to really follow God's will, to love them and to comfort them and just to do all that, you know, just, just to be with them and are you committed? Is that really why you're here? And they get a chance to say, yes, that's why I'm here. And then, then I say, okay, if, that, if that's your choice and you're really serious about this, then you just take one step forward and we'll, we'll do this thing. We'll, get, we'll, we'll move forward with the ceremony. And so that's a question of intent, a question that challenges motive. I don't think it's too dangerous. I've never had anybody go, you know, now that I think of it, um, no, I don't, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, you have a little bit of nerves, but, you know, going into it, but I've never had that happen. And I'm so glad because I don't know what I'd do. I'd probably have to refund the money and we'd have to all go home. And surely we'd still get the cake. I don't know. But anyways, um, but to be husband and wife, you know, really, is it love that you're here? God tells us to love each other when He brings spouses together. It's God's plan. It has been since Adam and Eve that He gave them uh, one another and said, it's, it, it's my plan. I want you to love each other. I want, I want you to love each other like, uh, like the Apostle Paul described in 1, 13, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and, and be patient and kind and, and, and all those kind of things towards each other. So that ceremony is just a reminder of me of, of intent and I, I enjoy asking that question because it just it maybe states the obvious but it's not always obvious and so we go ahead and say that. Well, the, the story in the Bible that we're going to be looking at today is the story of the Tower 
of Babel, the Tower of Babel. It comes out of, uh, of chapter 11, but I'm, we're going to go, we're going to do some background. Like I said, you're familiar with the story. If you don't stick around afterwards, I'll act it out for you or something like that. I, I don't think I need to do that. We're familiar with the story. I have preached on it. It's been a long time since I've, I've preached on it. But uh, uh, but I kind of thought of the more of the, the, the setting and the motive and the background to that story, most so, more so than just that uh, those few verses that describe uh, that event in chapter 11. Uh, it's really a story of a, of a family that was getting along, but maybe a little bit too well. <laughs> getting along a little bit too well, if, if that's even possible, because somewhere in the process of coming together and being this strong family, growing and, 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 and establishing themselves, they kind of lost their purpose, or they, they, had, they, they developed a misguided purpose. It was not their true purpose, the direction that they were going. And as you know the story, uh, God had to do something about that. Now this story and this, this event that maybe can help us remind of, uh, of our own lives and the life that we're building and the motives that we have, uh, it's a story really about the descendants of Noah. And so and when you come to that time in the Bible, uh, we're really talking about the descendants of, of Noah, and that's where the story settles in at, both before that event and after that event. We're following the lineage of Noah. We know from the Adam to, uh, to the time of, of the flood uh, that uh, there was, uh, you know, the earth was, was being populated, but they too lost their direction. And so uh, we kind of see the whole backdrop of when this pinpoint uh, lesson came. Uh, in Scripture. So if you got your Bible, go ahead and turn to uh, around chapter 9 of, uh, of, the, of Genesis. To get the background, I'm probably going to be reminding you of a lot of things you already know today. That's great. If you, uh, if you already do, if not, maybe it'll just be some good reminders on some, some biblical uh, history. But the descendants of Noah are mentioned prior to the discussion in, of, uh, of the Tower of Babel. And in uh, chapter 9, verses 28 and 29, the very end of chapter 9, actually, uh, it reminds us, it kind of puts it into line of this, this family group that we're talking about, uh, the descendants of who would be the builders of the Tower uh, of Babel. And it says in verse 28, it says, After the flood, so we get, get out of the boat, all right, after the flood, Noah lived 350 years. And then it tells us in that last verse, all together Noah lived... 950 years and then he died and he had to have been tired 950 years um, a man's life the legacy that he left behind going mostly into his lineage into those three sons and their wives that came off of the boat and and as the story unfolds or as the the, uh, the recount of this family unfolds and we think of our own uh, family lines and we think about the, the uh, the children that moving forward or the grandparents and great-grandparents moving backwards or whatever we think of our own story of our families maybe we can kind of uh, think along those lines as this is described I'm not going to read you the lineage you can say thank you uh, that we don't have to read through all those names but we know that it's the the three sons that came off of the boat with Noah as we as a backdrop to the story that would happen much later was Japheth, Japheth Ham and Shem and the lineage that goes through there, because that's an important family lineage, not only to the nation of Israel, but mankind and to us sitting in this room uh, as well. Uh, it gives a list of the nations. My, uh, my title for, for chapter 10 says the table of the nations. And so it, it begins to describe the nations of the earth. After all, coming off of the boat, all the nations, all the people, all the different family groups and clans that had spread out were all destroyed except for one man and his family. And so as Noah then uh, began to uh, 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 began the human race over once again, uh, we have this important lineage. And it says in, in verse 1 of chapter 10, this is the account of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, Noah's sons, uh, who themselves had sons after the flood. And so we pick up their family line, their story going out of that. And we think of the family, because we have to put this in, in, in the time frame, when we think about the distance of the time that gets spent between <coughs> this introduction, this backdrop uh, in just the previous chapter, to the time that the Tower of Babel actually took place, we're talking about a lot of, a lot of kinfolk, 
a lot of family, a lot of time, and, and we follow that along. I think of families, uh, just a few in our church, and I probably missed some significant ones, but some families with a, with a lot of siblings or a lot of children. I'm going to call out a couple names, hoping not to totally embarrass anyone. But uh, Paul Ann, uh, I'm always, I always forget how many, uh, how many children were in your family or brothers? Is it all brothers or sisters as well? Brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters. And how, how many? Eight. Eight, all right. That's a pretty good family there. And I've seen some photos, and you see all the kids lined up there, and you realize, and then you start taking eight kids and their families and their family families, and it adds up in a hurry, doesn't it? And so uh, Paul Land is one of those families that I think of. Uh, Joe Asley, you've got how many brothers? Had five, and uh, they're with the, with the Lord, but uh, but yeah, five brothers, and so we all got and what? And still got two brothers left, and you guys, you five brothers, always got along, right? Yeah, perfectly. Yeah, all right, no problem. Line. Uh, sisters, did you have sisters as well? Four. All right, brothers, sisters, there's a pretty good family there. And then when the houses get together and, and the families and when you start trying to track them and all that's pretty good uh, family group. Uh, the keys aren't here, but I've met, I've, I've met a lot of their children. They have a pretty good clan uh, for themselves. Uh, Gary and Dina Key. I think of Marlene Van Arsdale. When I go over to her house and I see her all of faith or the, or the family pictures on the wall and try to make sure who who's married to who and how they end up with Caldwells and all that kind of stuff and making all those connections and everything. Uh, large family and y'all are doing well as well your your the uh, uh, Caldwell family and, and, and the families and, and the stories that go behind that and, and all that kind of stuff so I kind of want to think about that as we think about the list that goes on in uh, chapter 10 now I won't list it like I said I won't mention the names but realize this is a long these are long list of each one of the three sons and their families and extended families going down but each one of them kind of inter, uh, ends with an interesting statement in verse 4, uh, the line of Japheth uh, ends by saying um, that uh, talks about the clans, uh, the territories and their clans within their nations, each with its own language. And then the next group talks about Ham and his descendants. And as that comes to a close in verse 20 of chapter 10, it says these, so after what was just listed, these were the sons of, of Ham and their clans and language in their territories and nations. And then it goes into uh, uh, to Shem and to his, uh, his line and all his uh, children. And that also closes out the book. Uh, verse 31, these are the sons of Shem and their clans and their language uh, in their territories and their nations. Uh, verse 32 ends chapter 10, these are the clans of Noah's sons according to their lines of descent within their nations. From these nations spread out over the earth after the flood. Now, there's a little reason why I told you all that. This sounds like okay. What, what does that mean? I had to go back and look at that because of the opening statement in chapter 11 when we read the story of the uh, Tower of Babel. Because we now have to place that story within this family and within this heritage and when did it happen. It's a little bit hard to peg exactly when it happened. But as we do that, we see a statement in chapter 11. It says, Now the whole world... Chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole world had one language and common speech. That's what kind of threw my mind into a tailspin. So I thought, wait a minute, I just went back and read that and talked about all the different na names, the different languages, the different nations, and yet they're all as one. And so I had to kind of put that in perspective and realize that uh, uh, where this fits into God's plan and God's design as we go through there. If I haven't lost you, that's what I wanted you to kind of get out of that but basically the um, the nations had spread out all over the earth and uh, that was God's original plan anyways wasn't it that was God's plan if we go back to uh, chapter 1 of Genesis you don't have to turn back there because you should remember that in chapter 1 verse 28 uh, it, it talking to Adam and Eve created the very first and he told them specifically his plan, not only his plan, but his plan for them, and that was for them to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth. It was never intended for them to just stay right there in the garden and just be by themselves, all right, or just uh, uh, just have a nice uh, small little family and not go beyond that. It was his plan uh, to use them to fill the earth, and so that was the original plan. 
you know, they did that, but they also lost their way. And if you look at the lineage coming out of the Garden of Eden with Cain, Abel, and Seth, those three boys, and the descendants from there, up until the time of the flood, you see a lot of people that lost their way. They were, they were filling the earth, they were fulfilling that part, but they lost their way. And then we see, we backed up into chapter 9 and realized that God also gave the same direction and the same uh, uh, plan. He reiterated His plan through Noah and said, Okay, Noah, now you and your family, I want you to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's God's plan. Now, somewhere in all that, if we kind of pick the story of the, the Tower of Babel and the time frame of that, uh, helps us to answer that question that I developed for myself. And that is, why does it say they are all spoke one language and, and, and we're all together when it seemed like uh, they had fulfilled that and created different nations and different lands? We've got to put that story of the Tower of Babel somewhere in the family line. It didn't happen at the end of those family lines. It fits somewhere in the middle. And if you're a Bible scholar and can put it, place it a little bit easier for me, that would be great. But you kind of think of it this way. From the time of Adam and Eve to the time of the flood. By the way, I'm thinking that after uh, the book of Revelation on Sunday nights, we may go to a Bible history class or something. We might try to, to learn some of this stuff that you know put it all, all the pieces together. But from the time of the Garden of Eden, God's original plan, and, his, and He turns the family loose, and, and, and uh, even though it was outside the garden, uh, turns them loose from that time to the flood, about a thousand years, all right? Um, maybe 2,000. Oh, I got that wrong. All right. Anyways, from that time, but here's where we put, we put the story of the Tower of Babel. Even though we're trying to place it within the family line of Noah and the full, the full list of names that we have there, the Tower of Babel happens approximately four or five hundred years after the flood. A lot can happen in four or five hundred years, right? Have y'all experienced that? Think back in the last one. Okay, not in our own life, but we look at our country's only a little over two hundred years old, and we see what has happened in our lifetime. And think about all that can happen. One thing that can happen is we can lose our way, and that's what seems to have happened in our story today. So. Here's God's message. Here's where we go with this. God's message to all of creation. What is God's message to all of creation? Well, you can say a lot of different things. You can, you can write it down a little bit. If you do write down a note, I'd write this one down. All right? Because this is God's message, message to, uh, to us or to the world. And that is, do God's plan. <laughs> do God's plan. In other words, just obey just obey and do what God has asked us to do. We tend not to, right? We tend not to do things God's way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start in this section. I'm going to ask you to give testimonies of how you've not done things God's way. <laughs> who wants to be first? I'm just kidding. We, we could do that though, right? Yeah, oh yeah, Skip Carter. Oh, she could tell. Yeah. Oh, I don't have enough time. Yeah, that's right. It was all my sermon time. But we think about all that God wants us to do and oh, it's just so hard to stay on track. And we're talking about for, for just our lifetime. So imagine generation after generation. Mankind has got off track so many times. We tend to do that. Don't we serve a loving and patient God? <laughs> to be patient with mankind. He's patient with mankind as a whole. Uh, even through the story of Noah and, and, and the judgment that took place there uh, and, and all that, we understand that God is very patient. Well, we go to our story. Now let's read verse, uh, 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 the first nine verses or so of, of chapter 11. And we get our story of the Tower of Babel. But now we've got the context within the family and within the purpose of God and why this event unfolded the way that it did. It says, So now the whole world is one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, eastward, this would be the men out of Noah's three sons and this family line, somewhere in the middle of that, because it gave us a whole history of all of them, but somewhere in the middle of that, it doesn't pinpoint exactly, uh, but it says, uh, as men moved eastward, uh, they found a plain in Shinon uh, and settled there. Uh, you know where that is? Without even looking at the Bible map, have you ever heard of a little country called Iraq? All right, we know where that is. We can tend to find that on the map. And basically, they found what what today would be Iraq, and they said, we're going to settle down right here. Around that same area, by the way, is where the Garden of Eden was. 
located and so they spread out but then they kind of come back there and that's where they begin to settle according to, to verse 2. Verse 3 goes on to say, They said to each other, Come, let us make brick and bake them thoroughly. They, uh, they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. So they had a natural type of tar to, to, uh, to put the bricks together. Verse 4 said, they said, Come, let us build for ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heaven so that we will make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down and he said, to see the city and the tower of the men that the men had, uh, had were building in the pro while they were in the process. And the Lord said, "If as one people seeking the same uh, speaking the same language, and having begun to do this, then they uh, then nothing that they plan to do will be impossible for them." He recognized their accomplishment, and he questioned their motive. I hope you're getting that. All right. So God says, come, let us go down. Who does He mean, let us go down? It's the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A good Scripture to understand the Godhead. All right, Come, let us go down and to confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from all over the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it's called Babel. Because the Lord confused the languages of the whole world from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. I like the way Max Licato takes that scripture and kind of puts it into context and describes this more like a, a writer of a newspaper article or a news report would do or something like that. He thinks about the scene that's taking place here. The scene is, he says, the scene is almost spooky. A tall, unfinished tower looming uh, solitarily on, the, on a dusty plain. Its base is wide and strong, but covered with weeds. Large stones originally intended to be used in the tower lie uh, forsaken on the ground. Buckets and hammers and pulleys all abandoned. The silhouette cast on the structure uh, is lean and lonely. Not, uh, not too long ago, this tower was buzzing with activity. A bystander would have been impressed with the, with the smooth running construction of the world's first skyscraper. One group of workers uh, stirring fresh made mortar, another team pulled bricks out of the, out of the oven, a third uh, group carried the bricks to the construction site, um, while the fourth uh, uh, shouldered the loads up the winding path to the top of the tower where they were firmly put into place. Their dream was a tower. A tower that would be taller than any other ever imagined or dreamed. A tower that would punch through the clouds and, and uh, scratch the heavens. At that, the, the purpose of the tower. What was the purpose of the tower? Was it to glorify God? No. Was it to try to find God? No. Was it to call people to look upward to God? Once again, no. To provide a, a heavenly view or a heavenly place for prayer, once again, the answer would be no. The purpose of the work caused its uh, the the purpose of the work caused its eventual destruction. The method was right. They had a good method. They had a good plan. The plan was effective. They knew how to implement it. They they worked their plan, but the motive was wrong. The motive was wrong. In fact, it was dead wrong. As we read this, and, and, and he describes the, the words that I just read in verse 4, he describes, Max Locator describes that as the, uh, the minutes from the meeting of the property committee, or the building committee of the Tower of Babel, as they said, come, let's build ourselves a tower. Let's build a city and let's make a name for ourselves. And what they were to accomplish would be incredible, but it would be wrong. It was not God's plan. It was their plan. God said, go. And they, they decided to settle. God said, go and spread out. And they said, we'll come together and stay here. God really was saying, go and fill the earth and make a name for me as, uh, as you enjoy all of my creation. 
And they said, no, we'll stay here and make a name for ourselves. Does that relate to us at all? We think back to the time of Christ. I remember Jesus in Scripture saying, go. <laughs> Jesus told us to go, and sometimes we'd rather settle. Sometimes He reveals His plan. He said, you're going to go and be my witnesses all over there. This is not just a mission trip type thing. I know we're praying for our, our missionaries as they're gone. But it's not just about the missions. It's about the motive. It's about our motive in life and what we seek to accomplish in life. And we can either follow God and go across the street and go to our neighbor and we can go and we get involved in His work and we can go to the church and we can be involved in the church work as it pertains to kingdom work. Or we can just settle to create a life for ourselves. And we might come up with a good plan. And we might have an effective plan. And we might accomplish a lot in our life. But if our motive is wrong, what will become of it? It will be another story of another tower in life that was built that God had to say, stop. That's not what I want you to do. That's not my plan for you and it's not my kingdom plan for all of eternity. This is a temporary home, isn't it? Okay. We have temporary homes in this temporary home. and So uh, we can mow our lawn and we can do some repairs and we can do that. That's okay. That's part of life and everything. But that's sure not eternal. All right, It's not eternal. And how quick the things of this earth can perish. We've been reminded as mankind over and over and over that the things that we seek to build that are temporary will someday be gone. No matter how well they're built, how strong they are, how impressive they are. If it's not God's work, it's not good work. Jesus told us to go and we often settle. So why are we doing the things that we do? Once again, Max Licato brings this terminology in, in better words, I think, than I could say. But he said, God will not permit us to replace His supreme... Uh, it will not, will not, let me start again. God will not permit us to replace Him as supreme in the universe. We belong to Him. And we are responsible for our actions. So they came up with their plan. They worked their plan. We come up with our plans and we work our plans as well. We often ask the question when we're young, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> Some of us never grow up. But anyways, we're asked the question, when, if you grow up, when you grow up, what do you want to be? <laughs> and the best question would be, what does God want you to be? What are you going to do with your life? Is it really up to you? Do you need a good life coach that tells you what you need to do next? Or how do you get out of the mess that you're in or move forward in life? Or do you just say, God, what do you want my life to mean in this world? What am I doing here? With our families, because we talked about the family lines, yes, it works through our family lines, all right? It's not all about children and grandchildren, but we also understand that our life is temporary. And after our life, if we, if we have children to carry on the legacy, great. If we don't, then what will we do in our life that makes eternal purpose? Um, I leave the evaluation up to you. I'm not your judge. You're not my judge. But don't we all want our life to matter? Don't we want eternal things uh, to be what we leave behind? While we're doing temporary things, which we do in life, make sure we're doing eternal things. Same lesson we talked about in Sunday school. But what happened when they did this. The big take home out of this is God had to intervene. God's purpose will be fulfilled. Do we believe that? Amen. We're studying Revelation on, on Sunday nights and loving it. And they, When we talk about that, we're not talking about theory. Oh, this is the way it might end up. We're saying this is the way it's going to end up. God has been working a purpose, a plan for 6,000 years, bringing it to a head of which we see signs that it is very close. And all along the way, there have been people, people that we see in the Bible, people in our lives, and people in this very room that understand the eternal significance of doing things that will last beyond their own life and their own efforts when our buildings are destroyed, when our towers fall, when our careers are over, when our life comes to an end. There's something to show for it that says this was God's work. This was God's plan. And we're not perfect. None of these people we've talked about. Noah was not perfect. Adam and Eve were not perfect, obviously. And, and none of their kids were perfect. But it's not about being perfect. It's about following God's plan. Because God's plan is perfect. And it comes to a perfect ending 
with Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. And those who love and follow and believe and trust in Him will get to spend all eternity with Him. And those that don't, won't. And that's not God's desire. God's desire is for each one of us to be with Him for all eternity. That's God's purpose. That's God's plan. How can we fit into that? How can we fit our purpose and our plan and our time and our energy into, into that? And you have to answer that for yourself. You need to discover that for yourself. If He tells you to build an ark like He told Noah, build an ark. I don't think He's going to tell you that. Anyways, uh, if, if He tells you uh, to, to, to be the king like King David, I'm going to anoint you as king, great, be the king. You may be the king of your household. Or you may be the king of your company. Or you may be king of the walk. I don't know. But do what God tells you to do. It's about obedience. And I think it's also about admitting that it's not about us. Because we are weak in our own strength. We might build a tower, but it's not going to last. In our own strength, we might accomplish what we set out to accomplish, but it's not what God wants us to accomplish. He may just have to intervene and say, that's not my plan. I'm going to move you in another direction. And He will do that. And I'm glad that He does that. As we stand together, and I'm done way early. Let the record show. All right, y'all listened too well today. All right, but as we stand uh, and extend an invitation, the invitation is this: as always, get in with God's plan. God's first plan is that you're saved. But when when you're saved, that's just the beginning. Then it's what do I do with this salvation? What do I do with this life that I've been given, this eternal life that now I have? so that your life will make a difference. You've evaluated yourself, I hope, a little bit during this time. It made me to step back and, and cause me to think a, a bit too of what I do that has eternal significance with, um, with time just fleeting by. Sunday after Sunday, I think, you can't do Sunday again. That couldn't have been a week, but it is, and time slips away. Can we make a difference today? Maybe there's something God is specifically telling you to do that you need to make a commitment to do today. Whatever God's leading you to do, I encourage you to do that. Let me lead us in a word of prayer and then you respond as God leads you. Father God, we do thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the inerrancy of Your plan and Your, your work. Father, we thank You that uh, even though You involve imperfect people, God, that You work things out to accomplish Your purpose. And yet time and time again, we see that you ask for the obedience of your children. You don't force it on us. We're not your puppets or your robots. God, we're your children. And you ask us to live in obedience to you. You ask us to understand that you have a plan, not just for mankind, for the world, and for all your creation, but God, you have a plan for our lives. Over and over through history, we've seen lives that have made an eternal difference in this world. And we pray, God, that we'll just understand that whether it's uh, in small ways or large ways, God, that when we do Your work, nothing is too small and nothing is impossible. And we pray, God, that we'll just be found faithful and obedient to follow Your plan and Your work. Lord, perhaps we've gotten off track and today just needs, needs to be a day where we say, Lord, bring me back in line just as You brought the people back in line time and time again uh, to, to continue to do Your work. Lord, um, we also understand that You told us to go. And so it may not be so much what we do here today, but it will be what we are being sent to do, to go and to share the Gospel with someone, to go and impact someone's life, to get involved in a way that we've not been involved, so that the work and the efforts that we have, Lord, can be seen as eternal life, uh, eternal purpose. God, we love You, and we just pray You'll have it Your way through Your Spirit in this invitation today. In Jesus' name we pray.